Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the Dairy Queen on Main Street, Vancouver, Washington. Finally, a sponsor with cash. Well, actually, all this place has is memories. Like what? We'll find that out later in the show. So no money? Nope. Just nostalgia. Inspector Harris speaking. Yes? What? Gregory Thorndike murdered. Uh, What's the address? Yes. Yes, I'll be right over. Inspector Harris is here, gentlemen. Oh, yes, Oliver. Show him in. Uh, This way, sir. How do you do, Inspector Harris? Won't you come in? I'm James Thorndike, and this is my cousin, Robert Latimer. How do you do? Hello. Mr. Thorndike, the coroner tells me your father died of stabbing. That's right, Inspector. He'd been stabbed right through the heart. Who discovered the body? I did, sir. Yes, Oliver? It was around eight this morning. I was taking up Mr. Thorndyke's breakfast, as I do every morning, and found poor Mr. Thorndyke with that uh, uh, knife sticking in him. I see. Who is the last one to see him alive? Well, I guess I am. I brought up Uncle's milk last night before I went to bed. What time was that? Uh, about a quarter to nine. And the coroner informs me he was killed about eleven. Where were you three last night at about 11? At 11? Why, um, well, I was at the movies. Did anyone see you there? Mm, no, not that I know of. Mm-hmm. Mr. Latimer? I'd gone to bed early last night, around 9. I slept right through the entire night until Oliver woke me this morning. Well, Oliver, where were you at 11? I was taking a walk. I felt a little groggy and wanted to get some fresh air. I suppose no one saw you. I'm afraid not, Inspector. Well, this is swell. I've got three suspects, and all have flimsy alibis. One of you is lying, and I intend to... What's that? Oh, that must be my alarm clock. I set it last night before I went to bed. Pardon me, I'll be right back. What time is it, Mr. Thorndike? Time? Uh, why, it's it's ten, exactly ten o'clock. Thank you. I'm sorry, Inspector. I must have forgotten to turn off the alarm this morning when Oliver woke me. Yes, Latimer. And that forgetfulness is going to land you in the chair. Well... What do you mean? I mean that I'm arresting you for the murder of Gregory Thorndike. How does the inspector know that Robert Latimer is the murderer? In a moment, we'll give you the solution, but first... E.G., what are you doing? I am giving you a clue to the solution. Yeah, I heard that as well. Do you get it? Get what? The clue man. Are you daft? Apparently so. Timing is the thing. Of course it is. You give crime solving a bad name. And you, BG, are vexing me. Glad to hear it. Ask yourself this. When and who heard the alarm? I'm not sure I care. And that is why you fail. Now, back to the inspector. Mr. Latimer, you said that you went to bed at nine last night and that you slept right through the entire night. But it's the truth. I am afraid you're wrong, Latimer. The alarm clock just proved that. If you had gone to bed at nine last night and set your alarm clock for ten, as you told me, it wouldn't have gone off at ten this morning, but at ten o'clock last night. Yes, Latimer. You murdered your uncle. 
and we'll soon get the story out of you at headquarters. <laughs> Okay, how is it possible for the alarm to go off at night? In the 1940s, analog alarm clocks had no differential of AM or PM. The radio stations? Wrong. You truly are an idiot. AM is anti-meridian, and PM is post-meridian. Of course it is. I bet if I gave you a paper with, please turn over written on both sides, it would keep you busy for hours. That does sound fun. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. On the show today, we have quite the group of stories. Lots of them, in fact. We open with a review of one of my favorite audiobooks, Moon, the Dragon Prince. This is a great story with excellent narration. Then we have a special tale from the archives of These Are Your Stories. A chance encounter on the beach will have your jaws dropping. Also, The sincerity of it all will make you a believer. Our featured story comes from the pages of the Pulp Mags. I'm a big fan of alien invasion adventures, and this one is not quite like anything you've heard before. To close the show today, we have a short bit, also from Pulp Fiction, about DNA before DNA was a thing. It is titled Resurrection, and it happens in a bar. Every once in a while, I get an email that means a lot to me. Either it comes at the right time or says something that brings back memories. We have both of these and more with this email sent in by Lee Maynard from Portland, Oregon, just across the river from me. Lee writes, Hi, I've been listening to your podcast on iHeartRadio for two or three years. I listen when I want a light-hearted break from the continuous drama of current events while I'm painting or mowing lawns or the like. When I listen to the show, I enjoy the regular features such as the mini mysteries, so much like the Encyclopedia Brown stories that I used to read my kids. Also, your self-deprecating banter with the machine-generated voice. I want to compliment you on your selection of old-time radio. The quality of your selections is much better than the corny gags of Gildersleeves and Jim and Mary and Jordan. Maybe the most memorable to me was your broadcast of Vern's Voyage to the Center of the Earth. Episode number 599. Also, I'll bet like me you were an Art Bell fan. One of his best broadcasts ever was the story of Mel's Hole. Mel was a guy near Ellensburg who discovered a bottomless pit. It was a great yarn that included Indian legends, lost dogs, weird science, and a cover-up by the men in black. I often go over to Vancouver Lake to sail my little boat. Maybe I'll bump into you at the Vancouver Dairy Queen on Main Street sometime. Best wishes, Lee Maynard, Portland. Well, Lee, I just wanted to express my gratitude for your note. It truly brightened up on what had been a rather hectic and stressful day, and it was precisely what I needed. I get comments on the 5-Minute Mysteries all the time, but you're the first ever to mention my AI interactions. I love doing those each week. Speaking of Art Bell, I completely agree with you. I was and am an Art Bell fan. He was an exceptional host and storyteller, and his absence is deeply felt in the paranormal community. Coast to Coast AM has not been the same without his unique presence and captivating narratives. I do remember the story Mel's Hole. Claims about it were first made on Coast to Coast in 1997 by a guest calling himself Mel Waters. Waters claimed he owned a property nine miles west of Ellensburg, Washington, that contained a mysterious hole. According to Waters, the hole had an unknown depth. 
He claimed to have measured it using a fishing line and weight, although he still had not hit bottom by the time 80,000 feet of line had been used. He also claimed that his neighbor's dead dog had been seen alive sometime after it was thrown into the hole. According to Waters, the hole's magical properties prompted U.S. federal agents to seize the land and fund his relocation to Australia. It's also thought that this story prompted the Amazon original series, Outer Range. Now let's talk about the Dairy Queen on Main Street. That place is special to me. It brings back a flood of nostalgic memories from my high school days. Cruising on Main Street after the football game was a cherished tradition, and the oddly shaped Dairy Queen was our go-to spot for burgers and shakes. It's amazing to me how a seemingly ordinary place can become an historical landmark and a symbol of a town's collective memories. I often visit that Dairy Queen and Vancouver Lake, so I have a strong feeling that our paths may cross someday. It would be wonderful to meet you in person and discuss our shared memories and interests. Thank you once again for your kind words and taking the time to connect with me. Your note truly made my day. Now, let's get to the podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? Moon. The Dragon Prince, book one by Aaron Ehaz and narrated by Adrian Petru. Now I have to tell you, I have a soft spot for well-told fantasy stories, and this one fits the bill. Rather than try to explain it to you, let's get right to our promo for this audiobook because it does an excellent job of introducing it. Long ago. Zadia was one land, rich in magic and wonder. In the old days, there was only the deep magic, which came from the six primal sources. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the sky, the ocean. Every living creature in Zadia was born with the gift of magic. A spark inside connected to one of the six primal sources. From the greatest dragon to the smallest insect, magic flowed in their veins. But humans were different. Humans were flawed. They were born without this gift. Back in ancient times, the humans struggled to survive in the world. While the Zadian creatures thrived, many humans perished from starvation. Others died fighting one another over the scarce resources. Unicorns were always the most selfless of the Zadian beings. There came a time when, filled with pity, they desperately wanted to help the struggling humans. After all, it was not the humans' choice to have been born without magic. But the first elves were wary. They warned the unicorns that kindness was not always returned with kindness. It would be a mistake to trust the species. After all, if humans were supposed to use magic, they would have been born with it. However, the unicorn's compassion ran deep, and they could not be convinced. So, despite the elves' warning, 
the unicorns bestowed the ways of magic onto the humans. They gifted a few wise humans with powerful orbs called primal stones, which contained vast magical energy. Then they taught them to draw runes, to attract and focus the stone's power, and to speak the ancient words used by dragons to release that energy as magical spells. Finally, humans had the ability to take care of themselves and end their own suffering. They fed their hungry, cared for their poor, and healed their sick. As they thrived, they elevated humankind in other ways, learning about the world and the stars and the arts. They created songs and poetry and other beautiful things. But the elves were right about one thing. Humans were unpredictable. While most were good, some were not. One human mage discovered a new way to use magic that was swift and facile, but also dangerous and intense. This method used the essence within magical creatures themselves to unleash incredible power. Some called it new magic or the seventh source. But it came to be known as dark magic. Dark mages and their followers began to hunt and poach magical creatures throughout Sadia, for they needed fuel for their spells. A griffin's talon, a feather from a moon phoenix, any part of a creature where magic was concentrated. Perhaps the most valuable and sought-after prize of all was a unicorn's horn. Eventually, the humans hunted the unicorns until they disappeared completely from Zadia. The elves and the dragons were disgusted and outraged by what they saw. They were convinced the annihilation of humans was necessary and inevitable. But at the last moment, a daughter of the elven leader proposed the merciful compromise. She asked that humans be allowed to move and settle the lands to the west. Beneath a half moon, the Dragon Queen, who was called Luna Tenebris, rendered judgment that was both cruel and kind. Humans were cast out, but they were spared. And so, the continent was divided in two. Erevos of the First Elves Four moons have passed. Humans have crossed into the magical lands of Zandia and committed an unspeakable crime. They destroyed the only egg of the Dragon King and Queen. Now a young Moonshadow Elf assassin has been sent on her very first mission. She will make the humans pay for their heinous act. But before she can complete her task, she and two human princes make an astonishing discovery. A discovery that could change everything. And so, the three reluctant allies set off in a desperate attempt to stop the incoming war. Their journey won't be easy, but the trio soon learns that the most serious threat to their quest can't be fought with magic or physical strength. Can these young heroes overcome the long-standing hatred between humans and elves and restore peace to their world? This book tells that story. Moon, the Dragon Prince was written by Aaron Ehaz. You might know him better as the head writer of Avatar, The Last Airbender. This is an amazing journey along the ilk of Lord of the Rings, but is told in a simple and fun way that keeps you wanting more. It is full of adventure, rollicking action, and even some humor thrown in to round it into an amazing story. You will not regret having spent your free credit on this one. Now, if this appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can have Moon, the Dragon Prince, for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. 
This also gains you access to the included catalog, which is being updated constantly with new titles. So to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. These are your stories. Special edition. Welcome to These Are Your Stories. You might be asking, how is this different from the other segment? The answer is simple. These are special. But what makes them that way? Again, the answer is simple. They deserve special treatment. It may be the content of the story or how the story was obtained. Or it could be that the storyteller himself or herself is actually here in person. No matter the how, why, or where, what you'll hear in this segment is going to be special. Our special story for this time comes from Ireland, and more specifically, Ballantoy. This is a small village on the northern coast of Ireland. It was sent in by James Walsh via a Reddit post, and James has titled it Encounter by the Sea. I thought this one deserved some special treatment, and I think you're going to agree. Here is James's story. In Ireland, you're never far from the sea. I'm used to my proximity to the water in a way I imagine many of you aren't due simply to geography. I was born on the northern coast of Ireland, technically Northern Ireland, near Belly Castle, a small town up there. Like most coastal towns, our part of the world comes alive in the summer with people from all over. But in winter, it's quite barren and isolated. Unlike most people, it's that time of year beginning late autumn and running through the middle of spring that I enjoy the sea the most. There's something special about having access to sprawling beaches all to oneself. Even on dull days, the roar of the sea in all its expanse calms me, particularly at dawn and dusk when the light of the sky makes the water glimmer with a mystery that can't be characterized. My story begins and ends with the sea. Before I begin, I'd like to give you a brief rundown of Selkie, or Selkie lore. Selkies are a type of being, legend has it, who inhabit the seas around the northern British Isles, although they can be traced as far as Iceland. The sea north of Ireland is inhabited by seals, and it isn't uncommon to see a colony of them, or perhaps an individual, further out from the towns. I don't know if there exists an animal more charming than the seal, with its lively bark and smiling face so like that of a human. The silky takes the form of a seal, but it's really a being with the ability to remove its coat and take on human-like form. Traditionally, tales speak of silkies appearing as beautiful women but if you delve deep into the folklore, selkies appear in all kinds of human forms. Legend has it that they appear in groups on moonlit beaches at certain times of the year, far from human eyes. Here, they remove their seal coats and take on their human-like bodies, dancing with jubilance to music under the light of the moon before eventually returning to the sea. It sounds like a very innocent myth, but there is a darker side to the silky. Ireland is not a large country, so relatively speaking you can never be too far from humanity and civilization. If misfortune strikes and a human catches sight of a group of silkies, they will dart to their coats and make their way back to the sea without any hesitation. If However, the human takes hold of one of the coats, their skin, then the silky is bound to him. The silky cannot return home without this. Consequently, stories tell of men taking silkies as wives, keeping the seal skin hidden away. 
The silky will never stop longing for its home and family, but it will be trapped in the home of their captor for the remainder of their lives unless they're able to recapture their coat. Most would never succeed in doing so. Like most myths, I would have taken silkies with a pinch of salt. That is, until I was 17 and had my own experience that is really unexplainable unless we place some credence on silky lore. As I say, I was born by the coast. Teenage life can be challenging for anyone, but for me it was amplified by being a queer person in a very small community. It wasn't easy, but I found some solace in nature, which, as I said, provided me with headspace at times when I needed it more than anything. Ironically, the best tonic for my sense of isolation was isolation. Self-built on those evenings when I could walk ten minutes to the beach and enjoy the setting sun, which made the water glisten with hope and that unexplainable sense of mystery. I spent hours down there, particularly on those cold days when contact with other people would be minimal. Mostly, there wouldn't be much to say about these evenings. I would walk, and walk, and walk, and eventually begin to switch off. Not terribly exciting, but steady and constant. There was this one evening, however, when my path took a different turn. There was a section of the beach that was somewhat shrouded by dunes and rocks, a quiet cove a few miles down from where I started at. We were deep in the spring at this point. I knew it because I never could have made it this far along the beach in the winter months when daylight is minimal. I was trying to maximize my time here before the tourist season began and the area would begin to fill with people from all over. On the beach there, I was stricken by the sight of what looked to be a young woman. The light was beginning to dim, and the sea had a purple hue. She was strewn out on the sand, her form slender and gentle. It would have been somewhat unusual to see someone this far out along the beach at this time of year, but not altogether shocking. What was shocking is that she was entirely naked, not with a single item of clothing in sight, either on her body or near the sand. Although winter had ended, the Irish spring is hardly warm. It isn't rare for snow to fall as late as March and April. And the wind, particularly by the sea, well, it's biting at times and relentless. You can understand my shock upon seeing this naked figure on the beach that day. What made it more bewildering was the body appeared to glimmer. It was as if she was formed from a matter related to the sea, which gleamed in much the same way. Her pale skin imitated its hue, moving softly with the sun to create something that transfixed me. Now, ordinarily, I would have been deeply embarrassed by the nudity. After all, I was an awkward 17-year-old from rural Ireland. But this was different. In the same way the sea at this time of day calmed me and soothed me, it was though she somehow inspired the same effect, even magnified it. I lost track of the time I spent in that spot. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I stood staring at what I thought was a naked woman for any amount of time, but I can only be honest. And then it was over. She opened her eyes suddenly and turned to look at me with a shocked look on her face. Those eyes, I remember, were striking even from a distance. They were gray, but startlingly so almost sinking into the whiteness that surrounded them like watercolor and piercing despite the lack of hue. Her entire form was pale, a glistening shape that melded together and appeared translucent in the dimming light. She quickly and soundlessly rose to her feet and moved with sharp fluidity to the rocks nearby. Still frozen, I watched as she emerged carrying what looked like a silvery piece of cloth. I say cloth, but it didn't move in the wind, which was blowing in from the sea. 
She carried it effortlessly, at a fast pace, her eyes staring intently at me the entire time. When she reached the sea, she stepped into the water with the coat and disappeared into the waves. At this, I shook myself back to life and moved towards the shore itself. Much as I tried, I couldn't make out her form anywhere. She had vanished into the roaring water soundlessly and without any physical trace. I was bemused but exhilarated. I remained there for around ten minutes more before making my way home. The images of the evening etched into my mind for the duration of the walk, which was guided by the light of the now fully risen moon. My parents were frustrated when I reached my house, upset that I had been out much longer than they had expected, but their words seemed to drift over my head. I was quiet as a teenager, and I imagine it wasn't too surprising to them that I didn't have much to say, no matter their frustration. I didn't speak to anyone at the time about what I'd encountered on that evening. Being a bit of an outcast already, I hardly wanted to peer, even otter, and it would be a few years before I found a group of friends whom I could mull these thoughts over with. I did, however, spend the next few weeks burying myself in online literature about anything that could have been connected to the image of the woman on the beach. I came across silky stories and immersed myself in silky lore. Although it didn't entirely match what I had seen, it was the only mythos that I could find that was somewhat similar. I returned to that beach many times, especially in summer when daylight was much more generous. It saddens me that I have never come across that being that I had seen on that night. On one occasion, however, I had resigned myself to walking back home when I heard a bark coming from the shore. I was delighted to see three silvery seals in the water a few meters out into the sea. They moved playfully, their voices filling the air. It struck me that one of them, a little smaller than the other two, was looking at me watchfully, its eyes intent. The light of the setting sun hit its body, which sparkled with its rays. Then I smiled back, waving slightly. James Walsh, Ballantoy, UK Well, James, that is truly an amazing and wonderfully written story. Our myths, legends, and horror stories come from history, which was done mostly by word of mouth, songs, poems, etc. These were always taught as lessons to guide us. They had to come from someone who saw something that left an impression, enough to make it part of our lore. What did you see? Well, I live in the Pacific Northwest. I'm always looking for Bigfoot when I go to the forests and mountains. I've heard things that I can't explain, but I've never seen anything. So who knows? Thank you for sharing your story. Our featured story comes from the 1950s pulp mag scene. The golden age of science fiction lived and breathed in those magazines. It was our most enlightened time for science fiction as a whole and would guide what technology of the future would strive for. No, we would never have flying cars, at least not yet, but cell phones, the internet, robots, and much, much more would be created in the mind of these creative pulp writers. Our story today comes from the mind of G. L. Vandenberg. He was one of those writers who would flourish during the age. In this story, we look at one possible way the world could be invaded, but it's not what you think. It is titled Martian VFW and was first published in Amazing Science Fiction Stories, May of 1959. There is nothing like a parade, I always say, but of course, I'm a Martian. Mr. Crothers was a busy man. Coordinating the biggest parade in New York's history is not easy. He was maneuvering his 200 pounds around Washington Square with the agility of a quarterback. 
He had his hands full organizing marchers, locating floats, placing their many brass bands in their proper order, and barking commands to assistants. But Mr. Crothers approached the job with all the zeal of an evangelist at a revival meeting. As he approached the southwest corner of the square, he saw something that jarred his already frayed nerves. He stopped, abruptly. The mass of clipboards and papers he was carrying fell to the street. There before him were one hundred and fifty ants, each of them at least six feet tall. His first impulse was to turn and run for the nearest doctor. He was certain that the strain of his job was proving too much for him. But one of the ants approached him. It seemed friendly enough, so Mr. Crothers stood his ground. My group is waiting for their assignment, the ant's voice seemed to be coming from the very core of his thorax, which was a violent red. Good Lord! Mr. Crothers' mouth opened as wide as an oven door. Mr. Crothers, I believe the parade is about to start, and my group... Mr. Crothers managed to blurt out, What the, what the devil are you, anyway? This is the parade marking the International Geophysical Year, is it not? The ant had a pleasant, friendly voice. Well, yes, but... And you are Mr. Crothers, the manager of the parade. Is that not correct? Mr. Crothers rubbed his eyes and took another look at the strange creature. Its head was brilliant yellow. It had two large goggle eyes, which rolled like itinerant marbles when it spoke. The low-slung abdomen was burnt brown. It was bad enough, Crothers thought, that these ants were six feet tall, but it was nightmarish to see them in three color. Mr. Crothers, the ant continued, haven't you been instructed by the National Academy of Sciences that the Martian VFW is to participate in this parade? The Martian... Mr. Crothers' mouth was open again. Then he realized that when the ant spoke, its mouth didn't move. He picked up his clipboard and papers from the street. His voice was hostile now. What the hell is this? Some kind of gag? What are you trying to do? Scare a man half to death? Oh, we're not joking, Mr. Crothers. The National Academy, they didn't say anything to me about a bunch of clowns dressed up like ants. Mr. Crothers' indignation became intensified. He was loath to admit that he'd been taken in by such obviously animated costumes. Now look here, I'm a very busy man. The arrangements have been made, Mr. Crothers. If my group is refused a place in this parade, we shall file suit immediately. As manager, you'll be named co-defendant. The ant was gentle, but firm. The thought of being sued softened Mr. Crothers' attitude. Well, I'm very sorry, pal, but every contingent in this parade is listed on my clipboard, and you're not. I know this list by heart. What did you say the name of your group was? The Martian VFW. Mr. Crothers was amused. Those sure are the craziest outfits I've ever seen, he chuckled. Where'd you get them? Walt Disney make them for you? He followed his own little joke with a long, throaty laugh. The ant was impatient. About the parade, Mr. Crothers, there isn't much time. Oh, yes, the parade. Well, let me see. He thumbed through his clipboard. I guess there's always room for a few laughs. How many in your group? One hundred and fifty. And we also have a float with us. Not a very large one. It measures twenty by twenty. Tell you what, you move your group to the corner of Thompson Street and 3rd Street. Get behind the Tiffany float and follow them, okay? The ant paused a moment to record the instruction in his mind. Then he turned to leave. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Crothers cried before the ant could rejoin his group. Just who did you speak to at the uh, National Academy of Sciences? I believe it was Mr. Canfield. Mr. Crothers' face lit up. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? I'd have placed you right away. That's perfectly all right, Mr. Crothers. Listen, I don't know what you guys do, but those costumes should certainly bring the house down. 
There's going to be 4 million people watching this parade. I bet that's the biggest audience you've ever seen. It certainly is. With that, the ant strode away. Good luck, Mr. Crothers shouted after him. Daddy, Daddy, look! Look at the big rocket! The little boy jumped up and down gleefully. It must be a whole mile long, Daddy. What kind is it? That's the Vanguard, son. An autumn breeze from the East River chilled their vantage point at 61st Street and 5th Avenue. The Vanguard? The name meant nothing to the boy. Gee, I'll bet it can fly all the way to the stars. It's the rocket that carried the first artificial satellite to space. The parade, now three hours old, continued past the reviewing stand. I want to get a better look at the Vanguard, the boy shouted. The father lifted the boy onto his shoulders. The little fellow laughed and whooped it up, firing several shots from his Captain Video ray gun at the passing missile. The rocket moved on and the noise of the crowd diminished slightly. A 100-piece brass band was passing in front of them. They were playing The Stars and Stripes Forever. They were followed by the Saks Fifth Avenue display. Nine small floats, each depicting life on another planet. The National Academy of Sciences had a success on its hand. Wow! Daddy, I want to ride on it. I want to ride on that float and visit all the planets. Can I, Daddy? The boy became all limbs, trying to squirm down from his father's shoulders. You stay right where you are, young man. The father struggled to hold his balance. But I want to go to the stars. I can watch the rest of the parade from Venus or Mercury. Please, Daddy? The father grinned. Not just yet, son, but it won't be long before man will go to the stars. Who lives up there, Daddy? Oh, there isn't any life up there yet. If no one's living up there, why does anyone want to go there? Well, maybe there'll be too many people on Earth someday, and then we'll have to find another planet with more room. Another monstrous brass band was going by. The boy became restless. He began to toy with his ray gun, half interested in seeing if there were any sparks left in it. Why can't there be something besides so many bands in a parade? I want to see another float. The father tried to interest the boy by pointing out all the famous people who were also there. A variety of statesmen, the world's leading scientists and religious and cultural leaders. The president of the United States. The boy was interested, but not in what his elder was saying to him. He was looking downtown, his eyes squinting, trying to make out figures as far away as 56th Street. Then his mouth opened, not uttering a sound yet, just waiting to burst with joy at what was coming toward them. His father looked up at him. I wish you'd tell me what you're looking at. I'm all the way down here on the street level, remember? Daddy, they look like ants. What? Ants, Daddy, ants. A whole army of them. Ain't it exciting? What on earth are you talking about? They're doing somersaults and backflips and everything. They're coming right this way. Gee, there's hundreds of them. And they got a float behind them, Daddy. A great big float with something burning on it. The child sitting on his shoulders made mobility impossible for the father. And he couldn't see around the spectators. He resigned himself to stand and wait for this new spectacle to overtake them. The reaction to this new sight had already begun to work its way uptown, but getting closer every second, he could hear unrestrained laughter and rejoicing. Hey, take it easy. The boy was beginning to ride the shoulders like a bronco buster. By the time they get here, I won't have any shoulders left. Where are they now? They're almost here, Daddy. And they aren't ants at all. They're just a bunch of clowns dressed up like it. He began to giggle hysterically. Golly, they're funny. Can you see them yet, Daddy? Before the father could produce an answer, the ants were in view. They were a sight that couldn't fail to stimulate the funny bone. By comparison with real ants, everything about them had been grossly exaggerated to achieve the proper effect. They walked on their two back legs, but the four front apertures were far from idle. Some of them turned somersaults, others did complicated flips, 
consisting of two or three spins in mid-air. Still others, doing a kind of animated cakewalk, carried toy ray guns, which they fired at random into the crowd. The guns were something like the little boy's Captain Video ray gun, only larger. They emitted little streaks of blue sparks, which shone brightly but disappeared when contact was made with air. They were easily the hit of the parade, a three-ring circus all by themselves, as they pranced and clowned their way up Fifth Avenue, giving the spectators a wail of a show that was completely new. The guests on the reviewing stand refrained from any hilarity until they saw the float that four of the ants were pulling behind them. It was in keeping with the rest of the nonsense that they were perpetrating. The float boasted eight larger ray guns, three on each side and two in the rear, that fired the same fascinating blue sparks. Behind each gun, an ant stood on its head, wildly waving six legs in the breeze, begging to be noticed and laughed at. Above the guns, emblazoned in fiery orange letters, were the words, Martian VFW. This was interpreted by one and all as a punchline, and was treated accordingly. It was heartwarming to be able to see the president and so many other dignitaries abandon composure in favor of a good old-fashioned belly laugh. Daddy, I, I can't laugh anymore. The boy had to pause between every other word. My stomach hurts. Aren't they the funniest thing you ever saw? The father was too convulsed to be able to answer him. Daddy, one of them is coming this way. He's firing his Captain Video ray gun at us. The boy squeezed his father and held on tight. The father took a deep breath in order to be able to speak. Take your gun and fire back at him, son. Fire away. Go on. He's just being playful. He broke forth with another gust of laughter. I won't see anything as funny as this again if I live to be a hundred. The ant pranced over to where they were standing, firing its gun in every direction. The boy fired back. The ant took one look at the lad's gun and let out a long cackling sound which built to a crescendo and then stopped as though it had been turned off. The ant rejoined the group and they continued on their merry way. The boy fired several shots into the float as it passed. He wanted to see if he could knock out the blazing orange letters, Martian VFW. The letters continued to burn, but in the boy's mind, he was certain he had made several direct hits. The boy and his father watched the float until it was out of sight. They knew there wouldn't be another attraction like those ants. They must have been real professionals, the father thought. Such teamwork, such precision. Each one of them having a specific job to do, and each doing it to perfection. After them, everything was bound to be anticlimactic. More marchers, more bands, a few more floats. The boy was beginning to tire. It had been a long day. Now everything was dull. Daddy, I don't want to see any more. Let's go home. We'll stay another five minutes. The parade somehow seemed to be slowing down. The father yawned and let his son down from his shoulders. He looked across the street at the president and the other dignitaries on the reviewing stand. All were slowly raising their hands in salute as another color guard drowsily made its way by. Soon, the last group in the parade was passing the review stand. Another brass band. They were moving with the speed of a glacier. A full... Five seconds elapsed between each note of music. Everything was happening in slow motion. On the reviewing stand, the dignified hands went up agonizingly slow to a final salute, and they stayed there. The greatest minds in the world stood motionless, unalterably still, just as each wave of pandemonium had unfurled itself up Fifth Avenue during the parade, so now did silence take command. The little boy tugged at his father's coat. Daddy, Daddy, he pleaded. Why has the parade stopped? I want to go home. His words came more slowly with each passing second. 
like a high-speed phonograph playing at 33 and a third RPM. Daddy, why don't you answer me, Daddy? Why don't... His father never heard him. Fifty miles across the Atlantic, the fleet of spaceships hung suspended like lanterns. In the lead ship, the ant in charge of communications reported to the commander. We've just received the first communique from the advance guard, sir. Read it to me. The communications chief read from a large, perforated paper. Time, 0600. Mission accomplished. Manhattan Island cut down the middle. Immediate result of supersonic rays. Four million dead. Rays spreading east and west. Estimated time of rays full effect? 0800. Island will then be neutralized. Awaiting further orders. The ant folded the paper and looked up at the commander. Shall I relay further orders, sir? No. The commander of the ants paused and stroked his chin. We're moving in. A very different take on an alien invasion, wouldn't you say? I like this story a lot. It was read for us by Franklin Paul, who is a regular contributor at LibriVox.org. If you're looking for tales from the golden age of science fiction, LibriVox is the place to find them. One of the major influences of the golden age was John W. Campbell. He was one of the most prominent editors of the time. Isaac Asimov stated that in the 1940s, Campbell dominated the field to the point where all of science fiction seemed to be under his control. Under Campbell's editorship, the genre developed more realism and psychological depth. By consensus, the Golden Age began with the July 1939 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. It included Black Destroyer, the first published story by A.E. Van Vogt, as well as the first appearance by Isaac Asimov with the story Trends. Asimov said that the dropping of the atomic bomb in 1945 made science fiction respectable to the general public. He recalled in 1969, I'll never forget the shock that rumbled through the entire world of science fiction fandom when Heinlein broke the slicks barrier by having a story published in the Saturday Evening Post. Many argue that the age ended in 1946. Others suggest that it's still going on today. Two beans times two beans is four beans. Nescafe uses lots more beans. Ten beans times four beans. And add three more beans. Make 43 rich coffee beans. Yes, you get 43 beans in every cup of Nescafe. Real coffee beans, that's all there is. In Nescafe, 43 beans in every cup. Make Nescafe the all coffee instant coffee. With the left have another cup taste. Extra bean means extra flavor. Today's Nescafe goes all the way for flavor with 43 choice beans in every cup. As read by Amazing Stories, read by Amazing People. This time on As Read By, we have a very short science fiction story titled Resurrection. It was written by Robert J. Shea and is read for us by P.J. Vanderkoy. You're a fascinating person, the girl said. I've never met anyone like you before. Tell me your story again. The man was short and stocky, with Asiatic features and a long, stringy mustache. The whole story? he asked. It would take a lifetime to tell you. He stared out the window at the yellow sun and the red sun. He still hadn't gotten used to seeing two suns. But that was minor, really, when there were so many other things he had to get used to. A robot waiter, with long, thin metal tubes for arms and legs, glided over. When he'd first seen one of these, he thought it was a demon. He tried to smash it. They'd had trouble with him at first. They had... 
trouble with me at first, he said. I can imagine, said the girl. How did they explain it to you? It was hard. They had to give me the whole history of medicine. It was years before I got over the notion that I was up in the everlasting blue sky or under the earth or something. He grinned at the girl. She was the first person he'd met since they got him a job and gave him a home in a world uncountable light years from the one he'd been born on. When did you begin to understand? They simply taught all of history to me, including the part about myself. Then I began to get the picture. Funny, I wound up teaching them a lot of history. I bet you know a lot. I do, the man with the Asiatic features said modestly. Anyway, they finally got across to me that in the 22nd century, they had explained the calendar to me, too. I used a different one in my day. They had learned how to grow new limbs on people who had lost arms and legs. That was the first real step, said the girl. It was a long time till they got to the second step, he said. They learned how to stimulate life and new growth in people who had already died. The next part is the thing I... Don't understand, the girl said. Well, said the man, as I get it, they found that any piece of matter that has been part of an organism retains a physical memory of the entire structure of the organism of which it was a part, and that they could reconstruct that structure from a part of a person, if that was all that was left of them. From there, it was just a matter of pushing the process back through time. They had to teach me a whole new language to explain that one. Isn't it wonderful that intergalactic travel gives us room to expand? Said the girl. I mean, now that every human being that ever lived has been brought back to life and will live forever? Same problem I had, me and my people, said the man. We were cramped for space. This age has solved it a lot better than I did but they had to give me a whole psychological overhauling before I understood that. Tell me about your past life, said the girl, staring dreamily at him. Well, 6,000 years ago, I was born in the Gobi Desert, on Earth, said Genghis Khan, sipping his drink. Well, I hope you enjoyed that short one. It first appeared in Fantastic Universe, December 1957. I thought it was pretty neat. What did you think? That was episode number 627, and I need to say a big thank you to Lee Maynard, James Walsh, Franklin Paul, and P.J. Vanderkoy for taking part in today's show. You made good better. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.